Greetings and welcome to the Richard Dolan Show, where every week we fight a good fight. You need to watch this show because as more information comes out regarding UAP or UFOs, and especially UFO or UAP crash retrievals, it is more important than ever that we all have the proper context for understanding what we're hearing, what this all means. One key element that we must keep sight of is the historical testimony of these events, which have been studiously collected for more than 50 years. I'm not about sensationalism, but if you want an education, stay with me on this one as we explore the enigma that is UFOs and UFO crash retrievals. It's important. I'm going to be as concise as I can, so let's just get into it. I want to start by uh, pointing out an article that came out about a week ago. This was authored by Michael Schellenberger, that, uh, who many people in this uh, UFO field have been hearing about for the last few months. He's done some very, very fine journalism. Also, uh, other authors of this are Andrew Mohar and Phoebe Smith. This is an important article for a lot of reasons. So you can see the headline there. Uh, they say dozens of government UFO whistleblowers have given testimony to Congress, the Pentagon, and the inspectors general. In fact, the number given in this article is anywhere from 30 to as many as 50 whistleblowers. This is all in the aftermath of David Grush's testimony. Uh, many of you remember from last July in which he talked about explicit programs by the United States military and colluding with the contractors, military contractors, to acquire downed UAP UFOs one way or another to acquire and to study and what he called biologics. That is, let's just say it, alien bodies. That's essentially what he meant there. So all of that came out and he said it to Congress, which that alone is something quite unique. And we've never had that in American history before. So all of that's important. So in the aftermath of that, this article that I just referred to states that at least 30 Whistleblowers have given testimony to Congress, to the Pentagon, and to the IG's office of the intelligence community. Uh, it further went on just to say that these whistleblowers are either, uh, in fact, let me pull up my slide here for you. They're either uh, federal employees or government uh, contractors. Uh, the article suggests a number of whistleblowers and their coordinated efforts make it unlikely that they are spreading fake information. They don't rule it out, but uh, and I agree here, it seems very, very difficult to coordinate that many individuals on that scale of activity. But anyway, be that as it may, that's their conclusion. That's my assessment also. Uh, it goes on, just states the inspector general of the intelligence community denied investigating these claims of crash retrievals. I'll get into the specifics in just a second. Uh, their article states that the, his wording of his response left a little bit of room for interpretation. In other words, are they really not uh, investigating these crash retrievals or are they really just doing it under the some cloak of deniability? That's always the case you get with U.S. government on every level. Nothing's ever honest. Nothing's ever transparent. They just say what they want. They give the talking points, sound good, and there you have it. So we don't really know. It just sounds like he's denying it at this point. Article mentions the possibility of a coordinated U.S. government disinfo campaign, campaign but they uh, dismiss that as unlikely. Again, I tend to agree. Now, here's where you get right down to the, the hardcore facts here. The testimony of these whistleblowers, they're talking about U.S., Russian, Chinese programs to acquire, crashed or downed or somehow acquired UAP craft, reverse engineering them to understand and replicate their technology. And <laughs> this is where it gets really something, collaborating with what they we called non-human intelligences, NHIs, aliens. So all of that's in there. These are uh, really powerful claims. And, you know, as you could imagine, it's caused big stir in the uh, broader community and public, even in the UFO field. Like, is this true? Is this nonsense? What's the deal here? 
I'm just going to give you my quick take on this for right now, and we will obviously be following this story as it continues. But I'm just going to say everything that has been coming out in this regard seems entirely consistent with everything that I have been looking at over the many years that I've studied this. And then the folks before me, this is a field that has been, I'm talking crash retrievals, it's been going for a 50 years now, like really even before when Roswell broke out in the late 70s, crash retrievals were already becoming a thing in the early 70s. And uh, this is all entirely consistent. Uh, you know, UFO, UAP crash retrievals has been a personal strong interest of mine within the UFO field for quite a long time. And again, so I'm just going to say everything that's been coming out strikes me as entirely consistent with what we have learned. I just want to show you this uh, bit of information here. So from a, a little, an all too little known book uh, by uh, my friend and colleague, Ryan Wood, who wrote a very fine book called Magic Eyes Only. It's unfortunately out of print. I have no control over that. I wish that it were in print both in uh, paperback or hardcover and ebook. It's not any longer readily available. I am hoping it will but the information in there remains very important. That was a book that came out about 20 years ago at that time. So he's writing it around the turn of the century. Uh, Ryan collected about 75, what he felt were possible cases of UFO crash retrieval uh, from really starting around 1941 to the present uh, at that time. Uh, not all of them were you know, definite cases. Uh, there were some weak cases in there and he fully admitted it. Um, about 75 cases over a 55 year period. It's about one, a little more than one per year uh, on average. Uh, Ryan, when he did this, whoop, pardon me, let me go back to there, uh, stated that um, he felt about 17 of the cases rated above average likelihood might take on that then and now is that I think he was a little too tough, frankly, on several of the cases in there. I think uh, 20, 25 would not shock me at all going through those cases. But nonetheless, uh, that was his assessment, 17. Um, not all of those cases involved alien bodies and alien tech, but uh, most of them did. So, you know, you ask yourself, you go through a book like that, which I think is a very well- a uh, documented uh, account indeed. Yes, could there be 10 or 12 such UFO crash retrievals for real? And I think the answer, when you really start looking at the data is, yes, absolutely you can. Uh, people say, well, why would, you know, superior advanced aliens, they come here from another universe, another galaxy, and then they crash. How believable is that? You know, we hear this all the time. And I just want to point out, Advanced technology is not a guarantee that you are going to have flawless execution of your mission. We have advanced technology in our society. Let's face it, we're way more advanced than people of 1,000 or 2,000 or 10,000 years ago. They would look at our technology as essentially magical, the way that we look at alien tech. Really no difference. Uh, now, when you fly in an airplane, your odds of being in a crash are very low, about one in 11 million. Those are pretty nice odds. Totally admit that. But when you get into actually the number of accidents, it's quite a bit. Um, over uh, the last data that I had from uh, 2014 is that there were more than 3 billion people who flew safely on over 36 million flights. There were 81 aviation accidents in that year. Um, uh, for the previous five years before that, you know, it's going back about a decade, but still an average of 86 accidents per year. That's one accident for every 2.4 million flights, but also one accident for every four days or so. So, you know, really what I guess I'm saying here is it kind of depends on the volume of traffic. And one thing that we actually do not know is how much UFO volume, UAP volume there actually is. We don't really have a handle on this. This is something that I have been trying to understand for quite a while, uh, trying to come up with some sort of estimate of how much activity is actually going on in our skies, in our oceans, in our atmosphere, beyond. Uh, we don't know. My suspicion has been for some time that it's actually much, much more than we suspect. 
Uh, I won't go into all the reasons for that here. Again, I've done it before. We can revisit it. But I will just say, suffice to say that I think there is quite a lot of activity going on. And, you know, a couple of crashes, of UFOs here and there, really not a shocking thing when you really get down to it. Advanced technology does not mean you are omnipotent. <laughs> it doesn't mean you are all-knowing. You can still make mistakes. Things can still go wrong. Um, almost 20 years ago, I had a conversation with this man. This was uh, astronaut Edgar Mitchell of Apollo 14. I met Edgar uh, in person for the first time at this particular where this photograph is taken. That's Roswell, New Mexico in July of 2004. Uh, and, you know, it's an interesting thing. <laughs> Look how... I look young and he's alive. So there's 20 years go by there. Um, we went into, there's a door right behind uh, Dr. Mitchell, if you see it in that picture there. And we actually went into that room after this photograph was taken and I spoke with him. This is before I knew anything about the, the meeting of uh, Eric Davis with Admiral Thomas Wilson, the infamous Davis Wilson notes. I did not know about them in 2004. However, I spoke to Dr. Mitchell in uh, that room right behind him there. And he told me quite explicitly about his knowledge from two specific sources, he said, of the reality of the acquisition of alien bodies, alien technology, and the fact that these were being studied in deep secrecy. He did not, we didn't get into Davis Wilson. That, that was something I learned about uh, two years later, um, two, three, three years later, two years later, late 06. So, um, but nonetheless, he made it, it was a very explicit statement that he made to me and it had a very big impact on me. Uh, I will just point out uh, the research of this man here. I've spoken about him countless times over the course of my career. This is Leonard Stringfield. He's a true OG in UFO research and especially he is the original great crash retrieval researcher, more than Stanton Friedman, more than anybody. Leonard Stringfield is the guy who really broke this open about 50 years ago. That book, the picture there, it's called Situation Red. That was the book in the late 70s that where he mentioned some crash retrieval cases and out of the woodwork, uh, people started coming to Leonard Stringfield. He collected a tremendous number of stories from a wide range of sources. Uh, again, this is something I've talked about right here in this channel many times, including a couple of episodes with my wife, Tracy, when we did Intelligent Disclosure. Remember that? Um, I've talked about this many times on my website also at Richard Olin Members. Uh, one of his important cases, I would say, was the man he referred to as Dr. X. This was a gentleman that Stringfield really developed a very good relationship with, a rapport with, met in person on a number of occasions. Suffice to say, uh, Stringfield, who was a very careful researcher, in my view, became quite persuaded that this man was telling him the absolute truth. This doctor just said, look, I autopsied and tested alien bodies. Uh, he had worked at a medical facility somewhere in the eastern U.S. Stringfield never gave up that information, although he did meet with this doctor where the man worked. The doctor said, look, Based on the information, you're talking about beings that are four feet tall. They weigh about 40 pounds, big heads. They got a brow ridge, a little more of a brow ridge than what humans have. Uh, large eyes, holes for ears, and on and on. Uh, very similar to what you get with descriptions of gray aliens. Um, he mentioned no reproductive organs. They seemed clone-like, he thought. Maybe they're like androids. Um, there was another source that came. Uh, by the way, that doctor, I'll just point out, um, talking with Stringfield for a, a period of time and then suddenly stopped dead in his tracks. He said, um, I've just had my knuckles smacked by my, my people. I'm not allowed to talk to you anymore. Sorry. And that was the end of him. He actually was, uh, that was no more testimony from that man. Uh, one of Stringfield's sources talked about something called the infamous blue room. You hear a lot about this in UFO crash retrieval lore and testimony. What is the blue room? Well, in the case that Stringfield was given, this is a room that was literally fully painted in blue. And the impression you get when you read the account is it's to kind of identify all of the alien artifacts that are in this room. Anything that's not blue, bingo, alien artifact. This is a source that Stringfield felt was a very reliable source. That's how he characterized this individual uh, who was brought, actually the reliable source, source 
told Stringfield of a close colleague of his. So it's third hand or second hand, um, who's brought to a very heavily secured facility, large hangar, everything's blue inside, tables, shelves, everything, holding thousands, he said, thousands of artifacts. These artifacts were primarily not recognizable to this uh, witness. Uh, here's a quote from it. They were told that they were to study each object and determine its purpose, operating parameters, and whether or not it could be duplicated. There's a lot more to that. By the way, if you're interested in Stringfield stories, you can go pick up. It's about 100 bucks on Amazon, but you can actually get his um, seven collected crash retrieval updates. It's a lot of money. doesn't exist electronically. It's all paperback, but it's some of the most significant reading in the UFO field that I can think of. Uh, let me just continue with some more of Stringfield's accounts, which when you really think about it, how different are they from the testimony that's coming to the inspector general's office and the Pentagon and so forth? Uh, Stringfield vetted those guys the best he could. They're telling him basically the same types of stories that are coming through here. Here's another one. A uh, person being led, I think this might be the same one of the blue room, actually. So I'll just continue this. They, they're shown four large aquariums. This is like right out of an X-Files episode, except Streetfield's writing about this long before there was an X-Files. Four large aquariums filled with a pink solution, each containing a small body of, a, of gray skin, oversized cranium, huge eyes, no hair, we're talking gray aliens in tanks. He said pieces of metal were in the back of the room from slivers to large twisted chunks, presumably crash wreckage. Uh, there was a curator here who uh, led this whole tour of this uh, soldier and his colleagues. And he just related then at that time, the story of the Roswell crash, which at this time, uh, that was not a story that was widely out there. I had some bullets here. You can screenshot this uh, if you wish. Uh, a number of other Stringfield accounts. This is even these are a sliver of what Leonard Stringfield collected over um, well about 25 years of you know from the late 70s until his death in 1994. Uh, he learned of a retrieval of a UFO craft in 1957. Uh, alien bodies essentially recovered with great difficulty. He was told, but they got these bodies. Another witness, one of the most uh, dramatic ones, in my opinion, uh, who saw nine alien bodies at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in 1966. He said they were four feet tall. He was told there were 30 bodies in total at the base at that time, at Wright-Pat in 1966, 30 alien bodies at that time. He was told that a craft was at the base and said at certain military bases, there are mobile units in a constant ready state to recover downed UFOs. Uh, Stringfield interviewed a radar specialist at Fort Monmouth, New Jersey, who was stationed at Fort Monmouth back in 1953. Stringfield met him about 25 years later. And this is like an original uh, kind of alien autopsy video claim, except again, this is long before uh, Ray Santilli's uh, thing came out in the 1990s. This guy told Stringfield, I was brought into this military theater. No one briefed me. I got no information at all. I was shown a film of a crash UFO in some kind of desert. I saw the, uh, the interior of the craft and there were dead aliens inside a tent. Uh, lights go on. We're all told to leave. No explanation. He said a couple, about a week or two later, an intelligence officer on the base said, hey, that film you saw, forget it. It was a hoax. He said, I've been wondering what the hell that's all been about ever since. I've always felt that that was a test. And I think this guy maybe failed the test. Maybe he didn't react the right way. Maybe he told someone. Maybe, who knows? Like, if you're looking for applicants for a crash retrieval program, wouldn't that be a very logical thing you do? You show them something that's deniable and you gauge their reaction. This is, after all, a pretty dramatic subject. And you really want to know who you're dealing with. It's my theory. Uh, Stringfield had a bunch of other stories that are just equally incredible. Uh, someone else who saw seven alien bodies at Wright Pad in the 60s, uh, and on and on. He, uh, a former intelligence officer 
who in 1948 said, I saw a top secret manuscript about a UFO crash in New Mexico with, dealing with craft and bodies. Maybe that was about Roswell. Maybe that was about Aztec. Who knows? And um, this last bullet I've just got here, I'll just read. Uh, this was a Lieutenant Colonel who told Stringfield of what he said was intimate knowledge intimate knowledge of underground installations. And he specifically cited Fort Hood in Texas on this matter. Uh, and other facilities, he said, that had squadrons of unmarked, basically black helicopters that were, would be dispatched to areas of UFO activity, uh, including, he said, airlift operations. Sounds a lot like what we're now calling uh, Operation Zodiac, which has been discussed a little bit more and more recently in this field, including by myself. I know Linda Moulton Howe did a thing on Zodiac about a month ago. Very nicely done. Zodiac, I think, is uh, legit. I think it was the name of the, let's just say, the official crash retrieval program. Uh, you know, people have talked about MJ-12 for years. I don't think they've been talking about Zodiac until very recently. And I do think that this is right on. Uh, I'll just mention here, uh, Senator, late Senator Barry Goldwater of Arizona, very well-known man historically. Uh, in addition, by the way, to being a uh, member of the U.S. Senate, Barry Goldwater was a general in the U.S. Air Force Reserve, and he was a very close friend of Air Force General Curtis LeMay. Curtis LeMay, who's one of the most famous generals in Air Force history, um, chomping on that cigar all the time, was chief of staff of the U.S. Air Force and uh, was tight with, with Goldwater. Uh, Goldwater was into the UFO subject. Looks like he always was. And at one time, he um, famously asked LeMay about Wright-Patterson. And I think he mentioned the Blue Room as well, try to get access to it. And um, Goldwater many times said, this is the only time in my long friendship with General LeMay that he cussed me out and said, don't ever discuss that topic with me again. You understand, don't ever bring that up again. Uh, Goldwater talked about this quite a few times and uh, famously several times actually, he answered requests from constituents about uh, interested in information about the UFO subject and about crash retrievals and all of that in one letter. Uh, this is one statement he made. He says, look, 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 uh, essentially, yes, a lot has come out lately through freedom of information at that time in the late 70s, early 80s, FOIA was kind of a new thing and a lot of information had come out. But he said, despite all of that, this thing has gotten so highly classified, it is just impossible to get anything on it. That was Barry Goldwater. We can go on. I will go on in the future. There is much, much more to be said about UAP, UFO crash retrievals. But what I'm going to say to you here is don't be shocked by these revelations. This is actually old news for researchers who have been looking at this subject with any level of seriousness over, you know, however many years we've been doing it. This is important. This is serious. And it's one of these things that I'll just tell you, this is my takeaway here. What is the reality? The alleged current leaks are consistent with historical testimony, at least as far as we can see so far. All right. So we don't have, it's true. Like all we have is, is Grush's uh, statement, which didn't have as much detail as we would like. He gave his, his reasons for that. Uh, and now we have these claims of 30 or more witnesses. And yes, they're just claims, but from what it's looking like so far, these seem consistent with what we have gotten historically up until now. And I'm just going to say, based on all of my study of the, all of the data of what we can call UFOs, someone or something else is here. Someone that's not supposed to be here, they're here. This is being denied by our authorities. Whoever these beings are, whoever these intelligences are, they have radically advanced technology that is of immense value. Never forget, it's not just it's not just the technology, it's what it's worth. Everything's got a dollar value, everything's got a money value. The super advanced technology that we are obviously people are looking at it every single day. 
something I can instantly accelerate, do right angle turns. I'm looking at reports on a practically daily basis these days that are just mind blowing, mind blowing stuff. All right. That's of immense value. Anything that can do these things, transmedium objects that can enter or leave or merge from bodies of water and, you know, act in incredible performance ways like that. That's of immense value. So don't ever forget that. Um, and also don't forget the fact that what these beings are doing, they're all around the world. They are operating in every part of the world that I can imagine. They must have an advanced infrastructure where, whereby what they are doing is also important to them. This matters. They're operating everywhere. This must be important for them. And we, as a society and as a, a UAP community, we, not, we have to be asking questions like, what does this mean? And the last two things I'll just say here, our authorities, certainly based on the historical testimony and now what we're hearing today, have possession of some of that tech and some of those bodies or some of those biologics, if you want to call it that. And all of this is being kept secret from us. We are being kept in the dark. We're like, you know, this whole world is going on around us and we're sitting tied to a little chair with blindfold on, not able to see what's happening around us. But that's our reality. That's what's going on here. So don't be shocked. Don't be too shocked by ongoing revelations concerning these UFO crash retrievals, these UAP crash retrievals. You want to call it UFO, you want to call it UAP, doesn't matter to me. But we're acquiring them and our authorities have them. And, and uh, you know, I'm just going to say this again before I wrap it up. This is going to be a shorter than usual uh, program. There's a red line of UFO disclosure. This is the red line, crash retrievals. This is the line that must not be crossed by the authorities. Why? It's obvious. It's one thing to say, oh, yes, there's something out there. We're going to figure this out. We're looking at this just like you're looking at. It's a totally different thing to then say, oh, yes, well, in fact, we've, have, we've had their technology. That means we've been lying to you and we have been engaged in a conspiracy of silence. That's what that means. And I'm not going to tire of saying this because we're being told all the time, you are not supposed to believe in conspiracy theories. Well, <laughs> what is bigger than the UFO cover-up in terms of conspiracy theories? You tell me. This is the biggest of them all. It's the one that people have been talking about for generations. It's the one that won't go away. It's bigger than the 9-11 theory. It's bigger than JFK. Yeah, it's bigger than both of those. Aliens, real, cover-up, bodies, technology. Are you kidding me? There's nothing bigger. And so to admit that this is real, look, that's a serious credibility problem. And this is why I, I am quite, I, I'm, I don't like to make predictions, but I'm going to make this one. Yes, we've had, uh, there's amendments now in the current NDAA that if it's passed, it probably will be passed that will, you know, in theory, mandate proper reporting by contractors to the U.S. government of alien tech and all of that stuff. Yeah, yeah, the language is all in there. Uh, yeah, they put in this JFK assassination-like provision that's supposedly going to release UFO, UAP information. Well, you study the JFK assassination, you know how effective that's going to be. But the point is, what's going to be the case after a full year of this? My prediction this is not going to be a breakthrough. I mean, I would like to see a breakthrough. I honestly would. I just don't believe it's likely. Why? There is too much for the establishment to lose. This is not, this is a no win thing for them. The only way they're, they're going to get through this is they must be fully confident, like 100% confident that they have got this narrative and they have also got the tools of repression in place to A, prevent uh, you know, serious alternative narratives from getting out there and then be from actually punitively clamping down on people who, who go beyond what they want them to go beyond. Uh, maybe they're getting close to that. Maybe they are. I don't, I don't feel that we're there yet. I think that there's still, 
the free people of this world still have enough wiggle room right now. And, and I think it would be a very difficult thing for the U.S. government to acknowledge that they actually have been complicit in hiding alien bodies and alien technology, because that just opens up a whole can of worms that that is not predictable in how the outcome is going to you know turn out. So I just I don't see um, an outcome in which they're going to willingly do this. And by the way, if you look at all of the statements, all of the behaviors of the established, all the established statements, none of them give this subject the kind of credence that genuine students know that it deserves. They just don't. Yeah, even even now, you know, in this last article, uh, the the IG stated we're not really looking into these claims. Essentially, saying we don't think they're important. We don't think that they're credible. And you know, you you know, we saw the NASA study that came out recently. Same kind of attitude. It's like, yeah, it doesn't look like there's anything really outrageous. Uh, I will be talking uh, at some point soon, maybe on my website, maybe here, about a recent study by Rand Corporation. Rand, which is always involved in doing work for the national security state. Uh, Rand, which a couple of years ago, I talked about this, did a study with Google's jigsaw unit to clamp down on conspiracy theories online. Yeah, that Rand. Well, they just did a study on uh, analyzing the um, UFO, UAP data at the National UFO Reporting Center. One of my favorite websites. I go to there all the time. And they did a fairly detailed study of it. And I'll just say very briefly, uh, there's some interesting things that they did there. They looked at the kind of geographic distribution of 100,000 UFO reports on that site. Kind of interesting. Um, not easy to do. You got to go one at a time with those things. Um, but also, they went out of their way to try to disable conspiracy theories. They went out of their way to say, well, it looks like a lot of these uh, UAP sightings take place over areas of military airspace, uh, kind of slyly hinting that a lot of UFO reports are actually military craft. I'm sure some are, but that doesn't tell us anything. I mean, you go through the, the National UFO Reporting Center sightings and uh, there's not a chance in hell that you're going to find most of them explainable as military aircraft. Sorry, you just you, the devil's in the details. You got to read the specific cases. So there's a bit of, um, you know, the Rand report was essentially saying, well, we're not trying to explain this away or explain it one way or the other. But yeah, they kind of were. And then the last thing in that Rand recommendation, which is the one that you should be concerned about, is that they want the U.S. government to uh, improve. UAP reporting and kind of both coming into them and going out to the public. They want the U.S. government. I mean, this was how they basically put it, in my opinion. And anytime you're going to have the U.S. government get involved in this, in official narratives, you better be prepared for disinformation. That's where the real disinfo comes in. Not from private groups. It's from the state. Of course it is. We're living in the midst of a global revolution. Look around you. It's going on everywhere you look. Uh, narrative control is absolutely essential. And that clearly seems to be including the UFO subject. Well, and then I'm going to wrap it up here. Uh, a little shorter than normal. If you like what I do here, hey, look, like the video, help me out with the algorithms. You know what to do, click notifications so you don't miss new episodes. Subscribe to this channel. doesn't cost you anything. If you really support what I do, go to my website, richardolanmembers.com. Uh, there's members content. There's free content there too. I'm very busy there every week uh, doing what I can to shed as much light on this challenging difficult, demanding, but ever so important subject. It gets relegated to the fringe all too often. And, you know, we're starting to see some changes. That's good, but we have a long way to go. And those of us who care need to defend this subject because that's what it deserves. It needs people to defend it. And that includes me and that includes you. On that note, I will leave you. I want to thank you for being here with me this time. And I'll catch you next time soon. Meanwhile, let's keep fighting the good fight. Later.